Okay, as you know, last session today, we still have the field trip on, on Wednesday. Um, what we do have is around, there's a new person around the table, the virtual table, and you know how it works. Should she start Uh you start. <laughs> Introduce yourself so everyone knows who you are, and then everyone will introduce themselves, and then we can start. Right. Thanks for doing another round. I guess just for me, because you all know each other already. So I'm Dani. Um, I'm doing my PhD at the University of Haifa, but in a different center for German and European studies. Uh, and half of my PhD is in Germany and Leipzig at the Institute for Political Science. So that's where I'm zooming into you uh, now from Germany. Uh, it's a bit earlier with me, so I just needed to get a coffee, but uh, I'll get there. Oh, and of course, I'm working on migration studies, which has nothing to do with uh, terrorism and belligerency, but I have done these workshops before that are organized by Ido and Michal. Uh, so I'm really interested to hear uh, what you guys can bring this year to the group. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Dani. Uh, my name is Magda Pahoska. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Astor Institute in The Hague. That's part of the University of Amsterdam. Uh, where I'm working on uh, responsibility for military AI. So I fit right into the theme of this year. Uh, I'm Eden. I'm doing my PhD or SJD actually uh, in Georgetown. I'm a third year uh, candidate uh, and I study basically non international armed conflicts and international humanitarian law. Hey, Dani, I am Angelo Ramirez, Gutierrez from Colombia. I'm a lawyer, um, I'm an LLM and in international humanitarian law and philosophy of master's student and, and I work in a special jurisdiction for peace. Hello, uh, my name is Kaya Kovacevska and I am a postdoc researcher at the University of Breslau, Wrocław, in Poland, uh, researching currently the uh, new technologies and criminal international criminal law aspects uh, and I presented here on uh, autonomous weapons systems. Hi, I'm Julia Bai. I'm a postdoc fellow at the University of Pavia, of Pavia in Italy, but I also have a research position in the Debris Foundation in Milan in Italy. So I, my PhD thesis uh, regarded the role of non-state armed groups and the possible ways to adopt and enhance the adoption of self-regulation instruments. Uh, but right now I'm also work working on public health. So. Hello, uh, my name is Vilasa Marchesi. I'm a PhD student at Cali Leuven in Belgium. Uh, I work mainly on international criminal law. Um, and yeah, my PhD is on the war crimes of denying the fair trial specifically. And uh, yeah, here I presented on this information um, and its regulation under IHL. Nice to meet you. Dani and I go a long way. We operated the podcast, the Minerva Center's podcast, nice. uh, in the last two and a half years. I knew I knew this voice. Just that it's <laughs> like, I'm really sorry. <laughs> uh, so we have like three seasons of working together. Of podcast uh, working together. It's a, by the way, great podcast on early career researchers oh, nice. and the travel and the journey and the research they're doing. From depression. Both, <laughs> and, and the depression. Also, uh, everything goes in, uh, imposter syndrome, uh, everything, everything. And broccoli. Goes in. And, there, and from different fields, not just legal fields, not it's just... Interesting, um, interesting. <laughs> and from basically all over the world, from We've had guests from uh, Australia, India, Pakistan, uh, Europe, Africa, um, Brazil, and the US and Israel, of course. Um, yeah, so check it out. It's what are you going to do with that podcast? Uh, which is one question so you're not allowed to ask. What are you going to do with that? Yeah. The one question you're not allowed to ask PhD candidates. Is when are they finishing their PhD? I think that's the, the no. most yeah. agree. <laughs> and and what are you going to do with that? <laughs> it's linked to our website, by the way. So yeah. okay. you can find it there. As well as on Spotify and huh? anywhere you like to. It's on uh, their Apple uh, app. Yep. Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an Apple person. <laughs> okay. 
as you probably seen, the schedule for today has changed several times. Has it? <laughs> we were supposed to have a different presentation in the morning, and Daphne Rutenwark is not feeling well, and she is very, very uh, sorry, and, and apologized over 20 times already. Uh, she really wanted to be here, but she can't. And as she said, in this day and age, if you're sick, you stay at home. So true. Mm -hmm. So true. So we actually encourage that. So I'm going to kind of improvise a presentation I gave a few years ago, which I'm currently working on not just updating, but also submitting because it got accepted for pre-submission in a, a, a at the NATO cyber conference in Estonia. And I have the draft. I need to actually have a full paper by January. And, and, and yeah, and it's the one that actually I started working on right after I started my PhD, and I realized that I need to actually focus on my PhD. So at the end of the day, it got postponed and postponed, and it's a paper I'm co-authoring with Anna Leifman, which you will know that. And the, the, he, once a year, he asked me, what about that paper? And so now we have that deadline for submission, so we actually going to try to get it published. Uh, for some unfortunate reason, it's still current, even though so many years have passed. Now, I've had to update it, and I still need to update it even further. And this is why I'm actually looking forward to hear your comments and suggestions. And, and um, What's so, the title? Sorry? What's the title? That's the secret. <laughs> so the title is um, State Hacked Operations, the Application of Human Rights to Extraterritorial Hacking by States. That's the title. And, and the main question is, what happens when a state hacks abroad and gain control over either computer or data or communication, um, and is there an application of international human rights law on such activity, or is there is no? Clearly, um, we think that there is. Otherwise, it would be would have been a very very short paper. And clearly, it's interesting enough for others to think. Why are they thinking that way? That's why the paper is actually getting uh, accepted and approved, and not for the first time. Um, the general idea of the use of hacking by states is nothing new, it's well known, we know that states are doing that, we know that states do it uh, internally to some extent, but we, we also know it that it's much more interesting when they do it extraterritorially, um, because then there are questions of application of international human rights law. When it's done internally, clearly the application of uh, human rights will apply, and there are some safeguards within national law and, and application of international law, which is relevant to such operation, but it's not so clear about extraterritorial uh, activity, hacking activity. And the general question of extraterritorial application of international human rights law to cyber operation is debatable. Well, and then we can see it in, in Tallinn 2.0, they actually had a debate with majority opinion and minority opinion, and um, there, there is a question, a discussion of how, how it should be done. Um, the premise of our work is that when a state hacks into a computer or collecting data or some kind of uh, cyber activity, there's some level of control, either of the computer or the data or the communication, and that level of control um, might invoke the application of international human rights law 
if it mounts to sufficient level of effective control, um, could be also, put, and I'm going to discuss it, but um, in accordance to the level of control, you have the level of application of human rights. And that's a very European Court of Human Rights level of discussion that has been going up and down, up and down, up and down throughout the last 15 years, 20 years. And I'm, yeah, okay. Um, we know what's the importance of the available data online, the available data online. There's pretty much everything we own, have, and known about us unless you're a very, very extreme person that stays off the grid completely, your data is available online and it can be personal data like photos and, and your, I don't know, your university diplomas and your, uh, your papers, basically everything you write, everything on my PhD is saved on the cloud and after a big mishap that should not be discussed. And, but, sorry? Did you wipe everything and you have to start over? No, I had records. I had printed stuff as well. Oh. So, <laughs> so reprinting, oh, very 1980. <laughs> yeah. Uh, old school is good sometimes. But, uh, so we're talking about photos, video, and, and also medical records and sensitive stuff and just the, the work stuff and the today stuff, everything is available today online. So we don't really need to talk about the importance of the data that we have installed in either your computer at home or on clouds. Can I push on data? Sorry? It, can I push on the data? Everything, yeah. Okay. I mean, can we do, like, are we doing interactive or you're talking then as questions because- Let's see how the question goes. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the chair, so you're sorry. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so you're talking Depends about on how like, the question goes, right? right? You're talking about state hacking operations. So I'm guessing that do you envision <clears throat> them hacking an individual, like, you know, unknown, like uh, Ido was inside, or like, you know, head of state or something. So, because I think that also makes the importance of this. I'm trying to see how far are you jumping ahead. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes. you get that. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, I the slide. Um, yeah, that's the difference between a good question and a great question, right? A good question I have the answer to, the great question I have the slide. I have the slides, so. It's just on my slide. Though. Yeah, so I don't have slides today, so you only get good questions. So, um, access can be gained by various methods, and that includes targeting a specific computer or um, communication generally, or a cloud. You can gain control for a short term, you can gain control for a long term. You can have actual full control over the computer um, or partial co control over the computer. You can monitor data, like using buzzwords and searches and, and uh, like looking for the words terrorism or jihad or uh, Donald Trump is written here. It's amazing thinking the timing of the first presentation. Um, so these are your notes from like ten years old. Uh, of the, with, with comments, <laughs> not ten years. Old. <laughs> okay. uh, so we can monitor data. We can also manipulate data. So there are several levels of control that we can take into account, and there are many further more, but. The common thing is that we do need some level of control in order to get that information, to get, to get access to the computer or the communication or the data. And our premise is that certain level of control gains certain level of responsibility under IHRL. And we mainly talk and discuss the, the application of the ICCPR, where we talk about the level of effective, effective, control, effective control, and the discussion, as I said before, that evolved from that, that leads to the question of, um, I think it's septal uh, control, which usually refers to that, that the amount of level of control you have, the amount of level of responsibility 
you get over that right or the amount of harm you can cause or effect you have over the enjoyment of the right you have the responsibility to uh, in accord um so before i'm going moving forward let's talk about what i'm not going to talk about it's always good to leave the branches away i'm not talking about non-state activity I'm not talking about uh, internal state activity, okay, just outside. I'm not talking about having a physical control over a person. So it's not like going to Magda and tell her, give me your password. Because that never happens. Uh, <laughs> I don't need to force you, yeah, it should be someone else. Uh, but yeah, so I'm only talking about extraterritorial control over computers or data, pure cyber discussion. Okay, no physical uh, aspects of it. So we're talking about the relevant rights. Usually the right to privacy would be the main one that we're dealing with, but if there is any other rights that can be uh, relevant just as well. Um, and, and it's the application of that right within the cyber world. So, um, yeah, so with regard to the rights to privacy for that matter, there has been a lot of writing in the last years, which I need to catch up, which says that certain aspects of the right to privacy became more and more relevant in the cyber world because of our dependency of the data uh, online and the way it should be accessed and should be, uh, what can be revealed and what cannot be revealed. Um, the EU has been very, very active on that front. And we see how, how important, how adapted that right has been in the last years in, in the context of cyber, uh, the cyber activity. So the question is whether there's enough level of control to apply the relevant rights. And if it does, the state has the relevant obligations, mainly to protect and to respect the right, the positive and the negative obligations. We leave out the fulfilled aspect of uh, thing, although could be argued that can be relevant as well. And it has been interesting to see also from the Tallinn 2.0 that that specific discussion has been has had, as I said before, a majority opinion and minority opinion, where the majority opinion said that um, you need some physical aspect of control in order to apply uh, ITRL. But the minority opinion said that there's a lot, as long as there is an effect over people connected to the state's power, if the state has the ability to affect a certain right, it has, uh, it has control over that right. So clearly we agree with the minority opinion, which I think in the last year has gained more momentum than it had when Tallinn 2.0 just got published. And we have two reasons to agree with the minority opinion. One, uh, gaining control over data, extraterritorial control over data is nothing new. There's nothing new about it and there's nothing unique that justify a different approach to that control over data or over the, the regular physical approach. And are you familiar with the concept of the loss of the horse versus the law of the sheep? Which is a very yeah. cute way to say that in old UK, when horses were introduced and cars were introduced, there was a question mm -hmm. of whether or not there, you need a specific law for the horse versus yes. anything you had before. And it turns out that you don't really, if someone steals your horse, it's in your property. And then if you get kicked by your horse, it's basically taught things. And, and there's nothing new about the horse which requires the law of the horse. On the other hand, with regard to ship, S-H-I-P, mm -hmm. it really changed and re re uh, change and, and completely uh, reevaluate the entire way um, traffic has been done. Uh, 
uh, merchandise has been shifted, so that the whole of the sea, everything, you needed a new legal framework for uh, for the ship. Okay, so the law of the ship is something that you need to adjust. Law of the horse is the symbolism of there's no need for a new system. So the idea is that cyber control over uh, data is within the framework of the law of the host. There's nothing unique about it that justify rethinking in the entire application of international human rights law uh, to that situation. And if we say, the other reason is that if we say that uh, IHRL doesn't apply to extraterritorial activity of the state, we basically provide a very, very strong incentive to states to violate uh, human right, the right of privacy, and that's a very, very, uh, it's an encouragement for states and in a way it's a slippery slope for the, the deterioration of human rights. Can I have a question and tell me where you're going to reply to that yeah. later? Uh, so what were the arguments of the majority of Why do we that you need, need a physical person? control? Yeah, why? Because, that's because now you less. You need a control over a person, territory, or a facility, right? This is, these are the, the three tests. The yeah, I know, the I know, but as the arguments you just provided were from wider background, the law of force yeah, these and are our the incentive. These are our arguments For to minority. justify the minority. We don't, have just, we don't have arguments to justify the majority because we don't. Apart from the, the test that was applied. That was the majority analogy. opinion in Tallinn 2.0 because that's, the way they think it should be interpreted, the application of international rights, etc. But yes. you need some level of physical control. No, but the idea is that the principle is that it's applied territorially. Extraterritorial application, by definition, is an exception. So all exceptions need to be understood narrowly. That's the point, right? So okay. So the narrow that that, that was actually my, yeah, the answer to my question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. No, but I think you, if you <laughs> present yeah, rationale yeah, yeah. for minority. Um, okay. I, I want to piggyback on that because, again, extraterritorial application of IHRL is something that is contested. Um, many states do not see it as an obligation. And also, when you're asking the obligation toward whom, it's kind of counterproductive to states to actually agree on this application that you're trying to follow because they're doing the hacking, obviously. They're trying to extract the same information, the same uh, privacy that you're trying to protect. So why would any state agree on that interpretation? And as we know, international law is what state see as obligation uh, to, uh, to do so. Because we're going to have it balanced. It's not, we're not saying you can't or you shouldn't do the hacking. Why are we talking about the implication of agreeing what are the implication of having such control? It's not just, I mean, every right is not absolute. Of course. So you can infringe the right to privacy if there is a necessity to do so. But the question is, what, how do you maintain it proportional and only within that necessity are the implications that we are eventually going to talk about? Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Oh. So, as I think when we talked about cyber related operations, I get the question that I always give to any cyber researcher that came what is cyber unit? Right? And in this case, we decide to deploy as what I fondly been talking about in the last eight years as the James Bond test. Um, I'm not bad. The James Bond test. Could James Bond do it or not? If James Bond could have done it, law of the horse. Nothing new. And James Bond has a lot of capabilities. Has, is there sorry, has, not had, has. <laughs> So what is still unique here? Unique here is the magnitude of data you can collect. The amount of data you can collect makes it a little bit different. Um, so if you say it's unique, it's the magnitude. If you say it's not unique, we law of the horse. Either way, we think IHRL applies. 
if, even if we are in the law of the horse or uh, the James Bond apply, test applies, uh, says yes or no, IHRL is still applicable to the situation. Um, and then if you do think that there is a question of uh, unique rule that should apply to cyber operations, that would be the Lex Specialis uh, version. And then we know that IHRL, while it's still applicable, there is a question of balancing the IHRL versus the, Yuval Shani has a name for it, the Lex Cyber something. Uh, and I never understood how to pronounce it, so I'm not gonna try, but uh, it exists. And then you just need to find the balance and. If there is no contradiction, and we don't see a real contradiction between the application of IHRL to the let's cyber something, then IHRL remains applicable. Let's cyber yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> Can I do another pushback? Yeah, um, sure. So when you're talking about like, is it different, is it not different? The whole operation that you are discussing is basically intelligence gathering or spy, you know, and if we don't, and state exactly, like again, chose not to regulate surveillance and spying and all that. So aren't you by kind of like pushing your ideas also invoking that, like trying to regulate what spies can and cannot do? Because I think to some extent, the same level of control maybe that you were imagining also happens if I'm, exactly, if I'm, I don't know, if this one was, this, was it a spy? I never really understand. Yeah, right, okay. So exactly. So isn't it ultimately kind of the same? And then you're trying to regulate um, intelligence and spyware and all that. Yes. And, and then no. a supplement uh, you know, comes into it. Yeah, so <clears throat> yes and no. Yes, because we are dealing with a certain aspect of it. But we also know that certain aspects of espionage have been regulated in a certain way. Uh, and. and my easiest example is uh, IHR. Uh, for espionage? Sorry? To regulate espionage? To make sure that if you re the, the spy has returned over the border, that he, that person cannot be charged mm -hmm. with any of the espionage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they leave it as a blank, mm -hmm. uh, as a black box in mm -hmm. a certain way, but there are certain aspects of it that are regulated, uh, you are not allowed, what are you allowed and not allowed to do in the extreme, but yeah, clearly it stays within, but and at the same time, yeah, we're trying to regulate certain aspects of it, and whether or not states will agree to it, that's a different question, clearly. Um, that's a different level of discussion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Writing the full PhD of what states should never agree to, like, off. I don't think any of my ideas will be adopted by the states. Yeah. <laughs> Still, you can write a PhD. No, of course. Yeah. yeah. So, no, like uh, so yeah, it's I'm a question sure. of no. It's a good question, <laughs> and the idea is that I don't think that states will object the premise. Okay. I just think mm -hmm. that they might argue that some of the data that was uh, collected also. Is also needed, and then that will be the. Uh, yeah. It's a different kind of question again. Well, then, so yeah. when I finish, you'll see if that question still holds and how we can actually adjust it. Uh, okay, so if it is about, if you agree that certain control will provide you a uh, certain responsibility, as Spider Man knows, um, the question is what is the relevant level of control that should be applied and should um, and how we adopt that test to the cyber uh, operation and so how we could talk about instead of control over a person or the enjoyment of a person's right can we talk about control over data instead and this is a tricky part because usually we talk about the enjoyment of the right so how can we have a German of the data if we're talking about level of control over the data? That's a gap that might still need to be uh, uh, 
completed in, in, in that sense. But we can talk about uh, what is the minimum level of control and the obligation to, what is the obligation to respect and protect? What are the actual implications of that level of control? So we talk about required level, um, data collection or control over computer are the two levels of control. Data collection can be referred to collecting just every buzzword, every relevant information that we're looking for. Again, terrorism and, and jihad, these kind of things. Or we can have a specific search uh, over a network or a specific computer. And data collection uh, might seem a little less severe and direct over the rights of a person, but it is definitely user sensitive because we can get control over medical records from the entire hospital. We can um, political uh, orientation information, we can have sexual orientation information, and again, uh, and all of them can be used later on, but we can get a big amount of data uh, and, and as, as data. Um, so control in that sense should be understood as the ability to obtain data and manipulate it, just uh, get it or to manipulate it. Um, sorry, I so said data collection and control level. And so the question of control over data is to actually get control from the computer and to manipulate it. That's my ability to have control over the data. And collecting data is just the question of the ability to collect data from a network. With regard to uh, the control test, we suggest two tests. One is the ability, is the penetration test, the ability to control uh, and command a computer or a network, actually to have uh, almost physical access to that computer, so I can actually gain uh, information on everything in that network or that computer, or the control test of the collection of data. Uh, I'm not sure if they are cumulative or separate test at this moment, but these are the tests that we refer to as the test of control. So ability to gain control over a computer and manipulate and control data. Is this test uh, inclu inclusive of the uh, requirement to break any kind of security? If I can't break the security, how can I have No, no, but access? what if there is no security. What if there is no Open security? source. Open source information is state having, by definition, a control over that. If it's a Wikipedia page, if it's, do we need any type, you know, break, break in into any type of system? Uh, that's a good question. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Maybe it's a silly question, but uh what is extraterritorial because uh, in some times data is in another place for instance facebook data containers is my information but maybe is in usa mm -hmm. so if their operation is by usa it is extraterritorial no so, so if the server is located, if this, the data is in the territory of the state, then the, the server is place? under the jurisdiction of the state. Okay. But then you, it's you, a question that Marko Milanovic uh, actually yeah. addressed that in his paper. He says that his paper was actually written while he was in the web, mm -hmm. but his home and server and, and everything was actually in, in, yeah, in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. I think this is uh, sorry, Marco. Um, and so I said, if the state is going to invade his home to look for things in that, in this country, he still has all his rights mm -hmm. in, in the UK, right? They are not allowed to do it arbitrarily. But then you have like those rights, so it's non citizen. I mean, if I understand Camilo's question because. I'm Eden, I'm Israeli, and I have, and, okay, and then someone else, a different country, the US, for example, is surveillance me, but all my data is in the US, so it, you would consider that to be a domestic issue and not this, like, extraterritorially 
uh, cyber operation against an individual? Like, because most of the servers today are like in a very specific location, so it would. I'm mm -hmm. usually not in the U.S. Right. Okay. Yeah, but... For for obvious reasons. Yes. So for that reason specifically. Uh, so it wouldn't. But again, so like uh, I don't know, most servers are in Finland. Where are they? I don't know. I, a lot of them are. So. So if the Irish government would do that and tap on someone's, so what's the applicability of it? Like how extent maybe what you're envisioning is actually a problem? Uh, this is why we're talking about the data itself mm -hmm. and the enjoyment of the right. So the question is... Mm. And the data itself yeah. is where? territorially debated upon where the server is, where the cloud is stored? Well, it's and then also communication, so we can actually do it you know, you can tap to information throughout the pipeline. You don't have to do it at the server. Right. So again, my question is, where do you put it territorially? Like, yeah. where the territory goes? As long as it's extraterritorial. And uh, my operation, I, I know as the state, if I'm operating within the U.S. or I'm operating extraterritorial. But even the state is not working. Like, its servers aren't really in the state. Like, so that's what I'm saying. Technically, mm -hmm. and that this is a very simple question that we can uh, circle around it over and over again. But as a hacker, mm -hmm. I know where I'm approaching. As a hacker, I know if I'm approaching information that is located okay. locally, or I'm actually trying to get uh, extraterritorial feed operationally. And if you're um working through a satellite, and then you're also doing like space hall? Yes. Well, the satellite belongs to? You're doing attribution, but if you're no, so well, a private, exactly. 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 It's a private person, which is registered line. at okay. somewhere. So you're doing registration. So the registration of like this. And I don't think the servers are in, in space. No, but you are manipulating, for example, yeah, that's a like a, yeah. a satellite, and then. Yeah. So the cloud is local? Yeah. And cloud servers. So if I am here, <laughs> that's, that's a problem with cyber. Like, yes, it's it's so technical. If you are here in Israel, but I'm accessing my OneDrive, where is it? If mm -hmm. you're in Israel and you're accessing your OneDrive, yeah, my OneDrive hasn't changed. Right? And how can we know where it is? So, but if I'm going to hack, <laughs> is it in you Ireland? Don't, you Poland? don't know. Yeah, we don't know. You okay. don't know, and you don't need because to know because they're distributed. And approach and the only one that actually knows in, in that case is microsoft. microsoft exactly so if no one knows but microsoft how do you know the scope of uh, the obligation that oh, you the have state, towards yeah, the exactly. that's the point that's the exact point if it's internally it's applicable because it's but if they don't know so well, how yeah. do they know if it's internal right. or not if it's internally actually is applicable Right? Yes, of course. What, what we're saying is that if it's not locally, mm -hmm. certain aspects of ITR still apply. So regardless if it's internal or extraterritorial, certain aspects of ITR will mm -hmm. always apply. That's the hypothesis. That's the, that, that's the hypothesis. That's the premise. That's what we're trying to say. And then, if, and then it removes the question of where is the server yeah. physically okay, located. Okay, have to remove it because it's yeah. apparently impossible to... For, for given moment, and regardless say, of that, regardless of that question, we're saying mm -hmm. that certain aspects there is a minimum threshold of. So, question of nationality are kind of like removed from this debate. Why should the question of nationality should be brought? Because so I, I was thinking about like whether or not a potential, but then I'm always going back to the question of whether it's a it's an architect and then like. <laughs> but no, 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 <laughs> no. I, I'll explain why because. I believe that certain level of control of a state in another state's, um, I mean, it's like only, I believe I think it's uh, the UN Charter, but like interference with sovereignty could raise to an arm attack. And then I'm, yeah. I'm, that's, I mean, I'm trying to, to, to figure out whether it could amount to that. Like, uh, and replace another state with a human being. Yeah, in some way, yeah, if, if it could yeah, be an interference, even though, I mean, by the way that it manipulates, I don't know, uh, individuals or, or, because that's when the, the nationality does come into place. <clears throat> but it's a different question that you're not going to answer. So I'm doing well so far. Um, 
regretting it like this is <laughs> <laughs> um okay so what are the implications uh, this is the last page so what are the implications? Well, first one, as I said before, no human rights is absolute. So there's a question of balancing between the need and, and the harm. And another premise is that the legality of the operation, which goes to the question, is not relevant. And this is where we, um, the legality or illegality should not derogate from the applicability of that uh, human rights or the enjoyment of the human rights. And then we go to the question of respect and protect of the human rights. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk about respect is the negative responsibility. So we're talking about um, when collecting the data, mm -hmm. um, we need the state needs to uh, prevent from obtaining non-required information. So limit themselves to what they are actually looking for and avoid um, collecting sensitive information that again, is not required. The immediate criticism would be say that if I'm uh, gaining, if I'm looking at trying to hack to Magda's computer, and I find that she's actually, uh, despite what she's saying, she's actually a cat person and not a dog person. Even though that wasn't the reason I hacked to her computer, probably I will use that against her. Mm -hmm. So it will come like an operation on information. But the fact that she likes sugar in her coffee and she orders a big amount of sugar every day um, is not relevant. So I should not uh, use and manipulate that data. And another way to implement the obligate, uh, obligation to respect is actually to try and use um, AI as much as I can. So remove the person from the collection of the data and do automatic manipulations and uh, collection of data as much as I can, which to some extent it's funny that in IHL, yeah. we're trying to introduce, maintain the person mm -hmm. in the loop. Here, we think mm -hmm. that it should be better to, to put that person away as much as we can. Um, and the positive obligation to protect is one to prevent uh, exposure of misuse, misuse of the data. And the best example that we use then, I think it's still relevant, is that Snowden was still new at the time. <laughs> so 10 years ago. No, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, it's been new, but... <laughs> Not that new. Uh, some of the information by Snowden is still, and it's, then he gave several interviews saying that uh, NSA employees were obtaining new photos in their search and they will spread them around the office mm -hmm. just for their personal oh, enjoyment. Okay. You have uh, the Good Wife episodes when you see the NSA people tapping to her phone and then like, you know, interfering, like we really know every, every, every aspect of her life. I think that's like also a good, uh, yeah. a good example <laughs> to explain the, this. I've never watched it. So <gasps> Oof. Go watch. No, it's really yeah. The Good Wife. Ah, okay, okay. It's over already, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 But it's there's super a good fight. interesting legally. Yes. Oh, yeah. it's, like, right. so it's like a spin up of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but it also has this, uh, yeah, of so NSA. Another metaphor. For prevent your, exposure uh, or misuse of the data and delete unnecessary data or data that doesn't, mm -hmm. there is no use for it anymore. Um, and then the last question that we, at this point, keep open is what is the state's obligation um, when it gets full control over the computer does from the level of protect does it get an obligation to protect it from others that's a very very interesting question that has two layers of third problems one is that if i know that this computer has good information important information do I have some level of obligation to make sure that others won't get to that information? And 
strategically I might want that. Exactly, because no one wants to know that. That's that you're saying not an ITR uh, <laughs> position. The Just question is, do you have some information? Probably not. But what happens um, if I find child pornography on that computer? Mm. Do I have some obligation towards the children? I have some obligation to report. Yeah. Do I have, but if I'm going to report that, so people will know that I gain access oh, to yeah. the computer. So yeah. I have some security issues that contradict that question, or it is deleted, but then again, people will know that I approach that computer. So there are, these are questions that go a little bit beyond the scope of the paper, but we, they are uh, interesting nevertheless. Because um, if it would be like in a normal setting, it would be obtaining evidence illegally, and then mm -hmm. like you can't do anything without it, right? If, if, but that's 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 you are thinking yes, we are very US oriented. Yeah. No, thank you. Not everywhere evidence obtained illegally would be dismissed that easily. But yeah, but then the interesting fact would be the ICC approach to the illegally obtained evidence, and, and that well, only this is not a war crime. Yeah, exactly. yeah, but but all, there is an aspect on violation of human rights, and you can see how but, they are approaching that and doing the balance between the protection of the child and protection of the privacy of the person that was breached. Again, yeah, but the balance of the ICC level is very much tilted uh, toward the need to get the evidence because you know the crime is like so grave, so serious that we really need the evidence. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure. But that's it's not really the point of the also. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. And I don't think it's applicable. But then do, don't we have the similar in criminal law in uh, regular crimes in the national jurisdiction? I'm talking about. First of all, I'm talking about two different things. I'm talking about protecting the children yeah. from getting that information spread at even more, which mm -hmm. is a practical approach, obligation, uh, and not necessarily talking about criminalizing that person holding uh, the information. But one, it's extraterritorially. The chances of me getting that person into criminal procedures are slim to none. And it's, uh, it's human trafficking. No, I'm, I'm really trying to, to think of like a crime that is cross border and all that. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not covered Again, under Budapest uh, Convention on Cyber Crime and Cooperation of States. It could be, but the question is whether or not I have a responsibility to, of course, exactly, to do yeah. something about it. And I think that's also the problem with kind of like assuming extraterritorial IHRL obligations, because while it's very nice, the first aspect of it, Kind of like you know maintaining that it won't spread around but then you you have to deal with the question of what are you doing and what are your positive obligations mm -hmm. towards it and i'm not sure if you can really say i'm only dealing with one and not the other you know it, like i i'm only dealing with what i'm comfortable with but not the, the things that i'm uncomfortable with and it again goes to the level of control that you have because yeah. if you really don't have this level of kind of a state you can't really say that you have positive and negative obligations toward this right. Well, I can. I mean, towards it's... the German of that right of uh, your should let her she's the check. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so it's the German of the right of the person whose data is theirs, and then talking about a third person. This is where we yeah, if exactly, get yeah. expanded, and I, I think we can talk about. The first level mm -hmm. of enjoyment, but I, I and then it's a again, it's a different level of enjoyment that could be expanded to. And I but you can, you can a, have the discussion separately. Yeah, and I, I agree, and I also think that it's an okay kind of like maybe perspective to say that extraterritorially, the like there are different level of again of, of obligation that you have. So maybe you have positive yeah. but not negative, or vice versa, negative but not positive, and then kind of like solve it on that level. Oh, with, even within the negative and positive, you can have different, different levels. levels. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I have a few, I need a clarification before I ask my question. So you say the state is acting here, but are the people state agents or are we talking mm. about hackers hired by the state? Like what's the situation here? Is it, does it, does make it, it matter? It matters because yeah. if they are hired by yeah, the state they are or oh, then they are useful and they have useful information. I mean the point is I said non it's not non-state actors. Okay, so it's always the state. state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then 
you have two cases you really have to look into because they are uh, from the CHR. Mm -hmm. um and they really have answers to well they touch upon many of your issues but you won't be happy with the what the court came up with they can be wrong they can be wrong but there are two very recent cases and either whether you like it or not i think it's worth mentioning the first one i'm sending it both to you right now the first one is big brother watch versus the uk mm -hmm. and the second is centrum for rabitsa whatever that is versus sweden both from uh 2021 echr you have all the data on your email right now mm -hmm. and um uh, the point, the bottom line of both cases was if it's massive collection of data by the state for surveillance reasons, it's pretty much fine as long as it's regulated in the law. So the court gave a lot of leeway to states uh, for mass collection of data for broadly defined security reasons. So the balance between because it's a right that can be derogated, mm -hmm. right of privacy, uh, the court in both cases gave a lot of weight to the security concerns the state might have, mm. and that includes extraterritorial um, collection of data. Uh, so definitely look into this. Uh, and many uh, human rights activists were really unhappy about the, the results because it's enough that the state has some sort of guidance, like the spying agency has some sort of internal regulations, and that's enough. Uh, to, to, you know, excuse, let's call it, the potential violation of the right to privacy. Uh, yeah, I don't see it contradict, by the way. I think that within that guidance, it should be de delete, avoid unnecessary data. Data is not necessary. Mm -hmm. And delete what, and avoid from misusing that information. Yeah, All but these I think levels of implications are, I think that they are sitting within that notion and just kind of implementation of those decisions. Yeah, but they are necessary or unnecessary based on what? And then like what you yeah, said, you said the ones I think is they have to be. So I think it also kind of like clarifies your question. Do you need to come with an intent to find certain information? And that's the only information that you can search and obtain? Yeah, exactly. So, or so you know, yeah, that's like, like yeah, that's what I understood like, from your... Uh, a different example. Um, in, in the US, <laughs> you're the you delegate. You're the delegate. Um, the right to privacy is, of course, sacred as the right of freedom of expression, right? Constitutional right. And if you want to search a premise, you need to get a warrant from the, from the judge. And the warrant is usually limited to mm -hmm. a specific exactly. aspect. Yeah, yeah. And a few years ago at the cyber center, there, um, there, 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 there. Oh, there is yeah. a cyber center, cyber world. research center at the uh, CCLP, something like that. Um, we had a guest from the US talking about cyber warrants. Mm -hmm. And then there was a question of, can you limit it to a, a specific data, a drive? Um, you know, what, what happens if you go to someone's computer and you see a drive and you just go and, and look into a, file, uh, a folder that you weren't supposed to look in and you see that child pornography. Is it allowed or not allowed? Because basically it's all data and all zeros and ones and, and all that. And the answer was that, yeah, a warrant can be limited mm -hmm. to a specific aspect within the data. When we're talking about hacking mm -hmm. and something that is a little bit unregulated, mm -hmm. there is a question of should you define in advance what you're looking for? I think states would generally say no. We're trying to see whatever we can. Mm -hmm. But I still think that you can say that the state has some responsibility that if they get information that is not necessary for them, they're not going to use it. And it is sensitive. They have a responsibility to avoid from either collecting it if they can, but definitely delete it and not let it uh, spread. Let it spread it. Yeah, so I think like sexual orientation, it's kind of the things that... Sexual that, orientation most likely be used. And it's bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it should, de facto, yeah. it's going to be used. And yeah. So Unless the person is very out and then this is unnecessary. Yeah, but obviously if it's out, it's, it's not material. Yeah. Can I say something? Uh, okay, so I think I only understand maybe the the intricacy of what you are trying to say only in, in the last part when you were talking about it. So like the kind of the way that you see data and the, the scope of it, which I think 
would have been helpful at the beginning of the presentation. So what you're saying about like limiting your ability to to find it. So I don't know how your uh, your paper is is written, but I would push it to the to the like the intro to just make sure you understand the kind of information that you're looking for and the, the way that the operation is similar. I think it's it's really helpful to have in the warrant to search someone's house, but in an question mark. And I really love the fact that you said that you don't care whether it's like the method is if it's legal or illegal, because I think it's again clarifies your your point. And the question well, matters legally. I have a problem with this sentence. I wanted to come back to this one. And I'm um, saying that if it's I think that it's good that you say that you don't care if it's legal or illegal because you still you still have the same obligations that you're trying to promote in terms of like the, the information and what you do with it. But I think what I would love to understand more is how you evaluate the level of control. So like, um, and what would you envision the level of, of obligation that you have towards monitoring data, manipulating data, and I think manipulating data is also, I'm not sure again what you're doing, because when you're manipulating data, what I'm are the obligations? Exactly, I mean, I don't understand obligations for that uh, part. Or how are you seeing them? I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how IHRL is kind of like um, used. And then I have the, a different question, and I think you're not really talking about it in the paper, and I think it's okay. But you it's, haven't seen the paper. I, I mean, from what you have just said, I, I I can understand that you won't talk about it. But assume that I'm um, a right bearer that you kind of infringe my right to privacy, and I, I my question is. How can I really? It's like who has the jurisdiction to determine uh, my breach of, uh, of uh, privacy? Is it the state that my information is stored at? Like, is mm -hmm. is it the jurisdiction of the state that it, that breached my my freedom of uh, of privacy? I mean, I I don't know if you're really talking about it. it's just an interest that, or understanding maybe more the the way that you speak. Sorry, Paul. Yeah, I think it was the second sentence on your last page. Can you say it again? Because maybe I got it wrong. <laughs> I had a good weekend. I slept well. Yeah. Second point. Uh, the legality of the operation should not derogate from the state's obligation to respect and protect. But this is exactly the opposite for the rights which can be derogated from. The legitimacy of why the infringement is happening justifies the infringement or not. If you read the, the, the two cases I told you about, uh, it, it comes across, across very strongly. That's the legitimacy, that's not the legality. But then, the legitimacy is security reasons. I have security reasons, so therefore I have legitimacy to do it. Doesn't mean that legality means that either you can go for it has to be by warrant, it has to be in advance, or it just has to be IHRL uh, legality, which means it has to be uh, you know, necessity, proportionality. And, uh, that's but to assess necessity, proportionality, and la 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 la, the, the reason why it's happening is crucial. I don't think you, I will have to see it written down, but I, it's something triggers me here, especially in light of, you know, working on these cases. Yeah, the, the thing is, if you say, if it's legal, there is, so you're taking it the other way that I, from the, that, you're looking at it from the other direction that I took it. I think it's from the direction that if it wasn't done legally, then it's completely- uh, Ah, this way, okay. I'm saying that if it's legal, clearly there are restrictions, but if it's done illegally, still we need some level of... Okay, that I understand. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, there was something bothering me as well. Okay, perfect. And now it's good? Yeah, but... Okay. <laughs> Second point on the last page, told you. Yeah, no, <laughs> but he didn't sleep that well this weekend, so that's why I didn't catch the page. <laughs> Actually, now, so this is the last page. This is what she's saying that. Um, which is, wasn't the last page, de facto. Um, okay, so let's go back to Heather's question. Um, so how do I identify the level of control? Um, that, that's the idea of 
it really depends on the person. This is a case by case uh, answer, which is the best and worst answer that we always have. Uh, but this is a case by case answer. And then the amount of control you have, and again, depends on what you're able to do. If you're collecting information, then responsibility is about the information you collected. If you actually have control over your computer, it, it is a completely different sets of obligation of what I can or cannot do. It. And this is where I go actually to the last unanswered questions of if I actually have gained control over your computer by a virus or a worm or something like that, then, or a Trojan, or a Trojan horse or something, Etc. then I think you have a much, the state would have much higher responsibility towards the, the rights, raise, protect, and respect. Um, collection of data, generally, I would say this is more of uh, uh, respect rather than protect, unless I'm going to uh, misuse it uh, externally, but generally, it would be a collection of the data. And the manipulation, what it means, um, it's very easy for me to change your bank account if I have control over your computer. But if it's not necessary for me, but just because I can, doesn't mean I should or right. I have to. And there are some other restrictions that should apply. Uh, and this is one of them. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to answer about the jurisdiction, and I think it's okay. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to answer it because this is a completely different it, level it, of it, discussion, it, it, and that sure. yeah. I'm not trying to regulate the activity and not yeah. necessarily the, the institution of it here. Yeah. Uh, maybe you should acknowledge that it's a different uh, <laughs> of questions. Uh, no, but I totally understand. Uh, I think no, that all the all the acknowledging thing is what would turn uh, like. A twenty-page long or paper to a thirty-page long paper. Yeah. I'm not related to that. This is no, a different level like of things. discussion. I need to explain why it is. And then, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. But when you're saying I'm not talking about you, do clarify what you are talking about, and that's also really helpful because you're saying yeah. I'm really interested in the state's kind of like obligation, and that's it, and not how to afterwards yeah. kind of like uh, yeah. follow it up to court and then yeah, sue it for violation for anything. Yeah, I think. It's also Clarifies your school. She's following the <laughs> Ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's part of being a chair. Need to be attentive. Mm -hmm. No, uh, I'm thinking about um, Cambridge Analytica, for instance. Mm, it was a collective of information or, or data, but I'm not sure if it, if it was a uh, control over computer so in the in that case because yeah, I don't know. Uh, I have to say I don't remember the facts of the situation um, it was a company um, from UK and they collected the political data from USA and Facebook, and they use that data to manipulate people for their elections. Yeah, and um, if we can think it was a UK state, what happened here, there, when you have the control over data, but you don't have the control over the computer. This is what I refer to as gathering information mm -hmm. and not necessarily control over it. But there's also a question of um, the right to privacy and its limitations. Mm -hmm. Because uh, what is. Has they used that, like, information that was available? available. No, no, no. No, no information. Yeah, yeah, available because that was at the moment when. Nobody cared about the regulations of Facebook. Yeah, and uh, if you yeah. did the test, uh, which kind of fruit you are, <laughs> you agreed yeah. on uh, yeah, using your data. In fact, for in fact was uh, Facebook uh, both the information to Cambridge Analytica? Yeah, no, they yeah. passed the information, but it was, again, I'm not sure because I don't remember everything, but if it was, and I think it also relates to the question, 
if the information is available, you just need to know how to search for it, not all. So I think that, that this is what I'm, I'm trying to say that uh, the right of privacy has a limitation, and usually it, it would apply where the right to privacy is expected. So if um, Magda, let's go back to Magda, is at her home petting her cat, a non existent cat, but petting her cat, imaginary cat, imaginary, <laughs> her, her imaginary cat and someone takes a photo of that in her apartment, that's an uh, infringement of her right to privacy. But if she's on her porch, like which is more public or even on the street, starting to petting random cats, and someone is taking a photo of that, that would not be. So there, there's a question of expectancy of privacy. <laughs> so the question of Facebook would be the same. Was that information that would be considered as private and expected was if your account is considered private, for example, I would consider getting into it more of the question of infringement of privacy. But if your account is open and everyone can see that information and just collecting that information from here and there, that would okay. not be considered. So it's a question of what actually happened there. But if it is private information has been done by the state, then yeah, I think it would be the question of having control over the data collecting the data and not necessarily having control over your computer where your account Facebook is because your account is not really on the computer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I have a side uh, comment? Uh, if you are interested in Cambridge Analytica and it's much more than just Facebook and US uh, manipulation, but also Brexit and Congo and other states where mobile phone data was used. Uh, I, I recommend you the book written by one of their ex-employees, so we of course are not sure how biased it is. It's called a Mindfuck and it's really easy to read over one fight and uh, and they show the mechanism how it was used and how long was the fight? Uh, the, the yeah, subtitle? Yeah, no, the, the, the yeah. 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 but that, that, that book is <laughs> on the whole concept of how it worked and who used that. Yeah. 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 All over the world. Any more questions, comments, ideas? Danny, are you okay there over there? <laughs> I actually have a question for you, Mr. because when you were saying about the uh, right to respect, how far is it going, what, are, what is the content of that, I'm just curious, uh, probably you not, don't go in that direction, but what is the current state of GDPR standards in, in this respect, because you said something like, we need to use AI because it's going to be more, let's say, objective in, not, in not discovering additional information that we don't want, and you did this analogy with Bayesian, which is interesting, uh, but, but how, of course, GDPR is regional and high standard, the rest of the world doesn't accept it. I really like when I open my uh, browser here and there is no additional <laughs> <laughs> pop-up, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but uh, it, what? Don't have that question already either. Less than uh, in the yeah, and I don't know really as fanatics about and that. I really I had no idea that people are actually choosing to not accept on cookies and like doing like the, you know oh, yeah. it depends if it's on the pop up how it's constructed. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but but just to say what the, what do you do you somehow touch up on that? How, how those because those are the most sensitive data, and we have some principles like this minimization of data. And uh, or I, I, at the moment, I don't deal with mm -hmm. it, and this is one of my notes. Well, today. 10 years ago. No, it wasn't 10 years ago, it's just because I know that it was already after a certain PhD, it wasn't 10 years ago. Just nine, right? <laughs> <laughs> and 11 months. Okay. But of course, that is. Well, uh, so certainly, and, and I actually refer to that when I said that I started talking in my presentation when I talked about the right to privacy, and I've mentioned very briefly that the EU has 
actually increased its uh, approach okay. towards privacy in that sense. So I am going to address it. I address it um, in, in, in a side way during the presentation. That this is actually what I refer to. Okay. So I think it's a follow-up question to that. Let's assume that you're a state under the under the obligation of the GDPR, and then you're conducting extraterritorial uh, espionage or computer hacking, whatever. Do you carry this obligation with you also extraterritorially? And I think that's kind of like what you were asking, or not? Uh, are you only obliged to simple, um, simple yeah, IHRL obligations, or are you also hear that? Then? Again, it's an interesting question. Um, I think there is a list of exclusions. <laughs> there is a list of exclusions mm -hmm. uh, where GDPR is not applicable. Yeah, yeah. So I think we would have to look at it. Yeah, we should look at it. Like the it's least exactly. expert on GDPR is <laughs> just like a happy person. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, then you have any question, comment, suggestion? Comments, I guess. <laughs> Okay. I was expecting to hear something about disproportionate violence as you wrote the article, but I haven't heard anything like that. Does that like principle relate in any way to your article when you're talking about um, just because you can, you should not always change someone's bank account, like the example that you gave? Um, or is this something completely different and it has nothing to do with it? With regards to proportionality? Mm -hmm. um... I think the entire paper is basically about proportionality. About you take, but you don't take more than you need. You, I mean, the level of obligation is always there is an infringement of the right to privacy when I'm hacking to either someone's information or that uh, either get control of a computer or information. There is a level of infringement of the right to privacy, and. The entire thing we're trying to do here is to make sure it's not disproportionate to the to the need to use that information being control. So the entire paper could be uh, categorized under that specific question. Another question that kind of like goes with proportionality and IHL is collateral damage, and I think that's what you're kind of alluding when you kind of like stumble upon maybe child pornography or you know, uh, and that is. <laughs> It is the collateral damage of what you're kind of trying to to, to obtain, and then like, what happened there? Like, is it legal again to use that or to do something with that if we're going into like IHL worlds? Yeah, but unlike IHL, mm -hmm. no other legal framework allows for proportionality. I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but it's just like when I. It could be. Like, <laughs> I mean. It, it could be, but like I have like a, a red flag in my like, don't go there. <laughs> don't go there. Yeah, but yeah. it is a nice analogy, don't you think? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would be the, the death uh, sentence of that paper. <laughs> yeah, like that. yeah, well, just collateral damage. You should allow it. ignore the child pornography. Or is it, is it exactly because it falls under this collateral damage and it's not. But for miss, like it's not illegal that you kind of like stumble upon it. No, the thing or is, the child pornography will be used against that person, probably. I, I'm just thinking of that. I'm but a good person. The question I'm is about how we protect the it. children. That's, <laughs> exactly. That's the, but the that's the general the question of each case of child. Uh, child I think the main question right? is whether they got paid or not. And this is called online. <laughs> <laughs> they paid me. I'm the editor, okay. so. uh, <laughs> but that's not a question really no. specific to this. The previous one, not the one where they paid. Probably paid, not just paid. Um, it's a question that I, goes beyond the scope of this paper, and I, I think it's a very complicated one because it also takes into account that child pornography is about minors, it's about there's so many levels of discussing that part, and I'm even leaving some of our discussions uh, away from that, uh, just because it is recorded. Um, no, but yeah, uh, <laughs> if it was, um, in, in, if you did give an example of like a, of a warrant to search someplace, right? And like, then you, yeah. you I, I'm not sure about the laws 
anywhere. But if you do, no, not Israel, not, not, not nothing. But international laws are not really like this. Exactly. Um, but if you do have a warrant and then you find something in this uh, search that, I mean, how can you? If it's reasonable way. Right, exactly. The, the reasonable the drive, the, yeah. the folder uh, has a title pornography or sorry child pornography on it mm -hmm. then yeah you can go and look into it because there is a reasonable ground to think that there is a violation yeah there. Uh, but if you just say photos of children, family oh, or like family photos yeah and then yeah okay yeah, yeah mm -hmm. so it's it, it doesn't look suspicious enough right because it's the reason whether or not ground. it was like dangerous. this is very again yes or, yeah. uh, or, yeah, or yeah, this, this example with child pornography took me completely uh, it confused me a lot because actually I believe there's also a matter of pro probably, I don't know, I didn't sleep that well tonight, but yeah, uh, like some states, like domestic law regulates the possession and uh, the usage of child pornography online as well. Even if like I'm checking the Italian criminal code, uh, whoever Regard, resorting to the use of internet web network or other networks or other communication systems accesses uh, intentionally and without just yeah, justified reason mm, but the pornographic material. Yeah. yeah. But, so yeah, but also, and the intention but also yeah. they, they say intention and then but, justified reason. But yeah. at the same time there is a matter if you stumble upon someone that then, if, who possesses these materials. But this then is the law in Italy, and then yeah. this question of what would be the law in Belgium. Exactly, that's that uh, like an interception of yeah. different... The question what happens when Italy gains control of that yeah. and yeah. holds that information just in order to use it for... Uh, for extraction. For extraction okay. of that person holding that, and clearly that you would actually take advantage of the fact that it might be legal to uh -huh. hold oh, that okay, information. Okay. But I still think that one could argue that they also have an obligation to make sure well, that that person is, doesn't spread that child pornography further. Okay. But you're always talking from the perspective of human, international human rights. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. right. So not private international criminal law. Which I don't care about. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, but that, yeah, there is an answer. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah, you, like, well, like, like, like double doing such, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That doing such an example may, may like, again, it's another thing that you have to limit yourself. Like, you have to explain that you are not talking about the thing, but you're just talking about the other. Or oh, Chapman so is just the, it's a very no, it's easy a, example in yeah. that sense. You can yeah. find something that is less severe. Gun than, trafficking, drugs trafficking. Yeah. 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 Yeah.